Hello and welcome to Thinking Critically, a D&D discussion, a podcast where we deep dive single word concepts or ideas within the Dungeons and Dragons 5e framework. My name is Danilo and I like all kinds of games and the crunchy mechanics that make him tick. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and I'd really appreciate a like or a follow. Today I'm joined by Sean Go Games. Thank you ever, ever so much for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Sean Go Games. I am a creator on the DMs Guild. I also have been a longtime player. Well, probably not as long as some, but I've been playing D&D and DMing since 3.5. Took a break and then picked it back up uh, with 5th uh, edition. And so uh, I also produce stuff on DMs Guild, but my goal is just to create games and share games and talk about game design. Awesome. Well, you've come to the right place then in that case. <laughs> so the topic of today is encounters. So what does that term mean to you? Yeah, I think encounters is something that with d and I think a lot of people think of encounters as just combat. And mm-hmm. when I think of encounters, I think of it as really it can be a variety of different things. Um, and it kind of is focused around a dramatic question of what the PCs have at stake, what they want, and you know the possibility of having a cost or uh, expending some resources in order to progress through that encounter. Mm. When, you, when you said that, what is it, a... Uh... Oh, you said a term and it's literally just escaped my mind right at the beginning there, but about a, a balancing act between, you know, having to get them to expend a resource, a difficult question, almost a dynamic yeah, encounter kind of thing. The, dr- the dramatic question. Something that's, that's the at word. Stake. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. The dramatic question. That is a really, really elegant and eloquent way of defining what an encounter is in D and D. Cause it's, you're absolutely right. Like as in the first point of my notes here is, non-combat encounters <laughs> it's yeah. literally sitting right at the top for that exact reason so why don't we start with the non-combat encounters then and maybe leave the meat of combat encounters for the, <laughs> the second half yeah sure i think a lot of the published materials and a lot of the um, official material kind of really drives players and dms towards thinking about encounters as only combats mm-hmm. and i think that by doing so it really limits a lot of a different exploration of different parts in D D. and i think in a way combat can often be less interesting than the other kinds of encounters mm-hmm. out there so there's a whole bunch of different ones you could come up with skill challenges are a great one You know, a skill challenge where you have to use your skills and abilities to make a certain number of successes versus a DC before making a number of failures can be really interesting because Mm -hmm. you have all these characters who are really geared for combat. And then when you throw these sort of bizarre or different challenges at them, it's kind of fun to figure out, okay, how do I take these combat abilities and apply it to uh, solving a problem that is... um, not within my regular scope and those kinds of issues where you're coming at things from a different angle is where it requires a lot of creative thinking and that's kind of where i feel like there's a lot of room to explore what your abilities can do Mm -hmm. and one example of this was recently i was playing in a high level campaign where i think we're level 11 or so Mm -hmm. and our cart broke we have a cart we're traveling with and we have to cut down a tree and like repair the cart well we have all these swords and things and you know we have powerful spells but we're like looking at these big oak trees and we're like well how how the hell do we cut these down without breaking our stuff <laughs> and so you know for a love most of love you know i could disintegrate the tree maybe that would work but then no tree to you know use for wood so the, i think there's a lot of kind of different interesting ways where um you can challenge the parties through skill challenges uh you know you could have something where it's diplomacy where you have to maybe impress a people to dinner party or deal with a mudslide or rock slide and there's all kinds of fun things you can do there yeah that diplomacy one is a good shout because as you were talking i was thinking about the martial characters so fighter barbarian are typically typically have less utility shall we say outside of combat due to the nature of the design of the class yes they you know barbarians are strong and could lift things nine times out of ten fighters know how to fight but i think when you said diplomacy that immediately hit me as that is within some fighter subclasses ballpark right that okay there's a tense situation here i am a seasoned professional in tense situations you know let me try and mediate almost uh, as an alternative to just everybody freaking out and either mind controlling or teleporting away or doing all the other sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, it's kind of funny when you mentioned sort of 
what what do the marshals do here? What is the utility they provide? Because that's a big question I have with the upcoming Candlekeep mysteries coming out, where it's you know going to be about solving problems, solving mysteries, and I think it'll be interesting to see how they handle. How does the barbarian solve a mystery? You know, Mister Rage, where he wants to just smash everything, mm-hmm. and. I think that also many of these skill challenges, by providing your players skill challenges, it actually gives your marshals a chance to shine, particularly if they have to use their brute strength or they can use an ability because they can expend more the spellcaster resources in some of these instances. For example, let's say you have a chase where you are, uh, you know, this isn't exactly a skill challenge, but it's similar where you have, you know, the party's chasing an individual. Well, if a cart falls in the way of a wizard and the party goes to, you know, vault the cart, yeah, sure, the wizard can use fly and fly over it, but then he has to use an, you know, a spell slot resource to get over that. Whereas the mart, you know, your fighter can just athletics over the cart or whatever mm-hmm. like that. So I think it is actually also a great way to, um, by providing different kinds of challenges, it's a good way to uh, equalize across the different kinds of encounter types, the the resources used and the power level of the different classes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point now and a good tip is that uh, certainly I did struggle with that almost need for however many encounters per day it is, six, seven, I can't remember how many it is, but there's it's basically a lot, which you might be able to get away with in a dungeon, but when you're out and about in town or, or something, it's not quite as easy to crowbar in, oh, there's more bandits, um, <laughs> seven times in a row. So what I'm getting at is having those skill checks that use up resources is another way to bridge that gap so maybe you only need like three encounters but in between those three encounters you've had a diplomacy thing that's required yes maybe somebody to charm another person you've had the fly they've had invisibility so by the time they get to that third encounter the casters are going oh actually i am a little bit tapped out despite only fighting one group of people yeah yeah no i think you've highlighted a couple really good things there is um one if you just think of combat encounters as combats and then you know you only have one combat per day your characters are just going to go nova on the combat Mm -hmm. and or it's just not going to be realistic you know how many times can you be stopped and mugged in a day you know exactly water deep and the other thing is it helps to really it can also tax other resources when you introduce other encounters. For example, if you have social encounters, uh, you know you might need a bribe or use potions, and mm-hmm. you you might you need to use those spell slots and like enhance ability, like you're saying, uh, like you mentioned with the invisibility or charming. That could be another one. So, the other thing too is by adding all these different kinds of encounters, it provides a lot of variety. And I think that having too many combat encounters in a day can really kind of take away from the, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it goes, it harkens back to that dramatic question where if you know you're just going to have six combats in one day, it kind of devalues the dramatic question of how dangerous is this combat if you know that there's going to be more combats to follow, then this one can't be as dangerous. So having the variety there, uh, what I tend to like to do is I tend to like to amp up the danger of individual combats and have, you know, above the normal CR Mm -hmm. or have enemies that, you know, are more threatening and then kind of have lower stakes, lower cost, uh, kind of, you know, the social, the skill challenges to kind of switch it up. And then it also makes that dramatic question of, is this combat dangerous, more intense? And so each combat feels like the stakes are higher and there's Mm -hmm. more at stake. The other thing too, is if you are, you know, if you are in a situation where you are going to, you know, have situations where you're not going to have as many combats in a day you can't switch the gritty real resting system especially for travel that's a good time to do that that way each combat does feel more impactful when you're traveling Mm -hmm. yeah i was gonna say that i think a lot of people do what you suggested in terms of i know i do of ramping up the difficulty of an encounter but having fewer of them now there's definitely some impact to economy and that obviously hurts some classes more than it does others. I don't know the details off the top of my head, mm-hmm. but just the way resources are get, you know, some things come back on a short rest, some things come back on a long rest. So mm-hmm. it's it's a really tricky one to get right, the spread of encounters over an adventuring day. And I don't think that, you know, any kind of normal DM <laughs> like you or I could ever, you know, you'll, you'll always be refining that skill. You'll always be saying, oh, that, I pushed it a little bit too far that time. Let me yeah. wind it back in. Oh no, wait, they they just stomped that fight because I didn't realise that it had you know, that, that creature had vulnerability to the magic that they've got. And then, you know, you just just through that iterative process 
but I am very much in the same school of thought of I like my universe and my setting to be to make sense. Yeah. And uh, a, li- a little while ago, one of the players was was like, "We we we don't have a lot of combat, and uh, maybe maybe we could have more." He was a bit you know a bit hungry for mm-hmm. it. Uh, he's a sorcerer, first time ever playing, so he's very much an A or a was at the time. Kind of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like combat. Like I'm here to kill things, and I'm a bit confused that we've just been talking to NPCs for three sessions in a row. Unfortunately for him, he, he missed he missed a session which happened to have combat in that was almost shoehorned in for his benefit. So he ended <laughs> up going like another three sessions. But um, I said to him, I said, I can put some in, and I ended up doing it. But I, I said like it doesn't it doesn't make sense. I, I can't. It's kind of just boring if you get attacked again by people or creatures come out of the ground. Or and yes, I know you can spin it into a side quest and this that and the other. But when they have some existential threat looming over them. Why are bandits attacking this town? It doesn't yeah isn't very interesting. Like they, yeah. they won't care. <laughs> yeah, and that dramatic question is something that I think whenever a combat starts, you know, and if it ends up being boring, I think that most of the times that dramatic question isn't being answered. Mm-hmm. And I think there's ways you can kind of um, sneakily infuse that dramatic question back into each encounter. So one thing that I like to do is whenever, you know, if the PCs are going to be attacked by bandits, like just make them have some sort of hook that circles back to the main plot. And then the the players will feel really clever or feel like they've gotten a clue from defeating this party of bandits. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, I had an encounter where I decided, you know, the PCs were traveling in a carriage and they were getting chased by these bandits and uh, they managed to get a few of them and they had some knives that had a certain insignia that led back to some shadowy group and then they feel like, oh, ho, like suddenly this this fight has gotten much more interesting and, you know, just infusing that question back in is why are we doing this? How is this important? Keeping that at top of mind is, I think, really, really important. Yeah, for sure. And and like, if you if you just have those boring, in quotes, encounters, it can promote you know murder hoboism of of just oh well there's another seven bandits to kill killed them cool moving on oh there's another seven to kill around the corner okay killed them move on and suddenly you're not really in dnd anymore you're in diablo yeah the dramatic question is important both in terms of why are we doing this and also what is the cost so if you know if like once you get to level five you can just pretty much wipe any group of bandits and it's not interesting anymore so nothing's Mm. at risk nothing's at you know what are we going to lose if this goes badly it's like well nothing really and so that's why it can be useful to put your characters on a time crunch too because then when they do expend resources you know there is a cost to that where they lose time the bad guys plan you know happens in a month and if they lose a day where they have to rest suddenly that has a real cost to it some groups will respond to that some won't you know, a lot of this, I think a lot of encounters and understanding encounters is understanding um, what will work for your group and your campaign and your tone, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wanted to talk about resources, the expenditure of those resources mm-hmm. in a moment. But the one anecdote I wanted to share specifically to do with bandits, funnily enough, is in my campaign. And this is OK, because this episode, I think the lag of this episode coming out will have caught up with when it actually gets to happen in my campaign. So mm-hmm. it shouldn't be any spoilers, he says, um, <laughs> <laughs> is throughout the couple of years we've been playing, the guys in my game have ob- obviously, of course, have come up with m- mercenaries or bad humanoids who were, on the face of it, unconnected, seemingly unconnected. Now, mm-hmm. as they're just about to wrap up this chapter and this dungeon, a little in between chapter fun i've got planned is they're going to be heading back to the main town their hometown and will be stopped by a large number of high women mm-hmm. essentially who they're going to go oh it's bandits again but this time it's going to be hey you you don't know us well you might know this guy and i'm going to have you know they they accidentally let one bandit run away in one of the encounters they, they yep. fled from run for their lives and they couldn't chase them down. And they're going to go, hey, we want you to work for us now because clearly you don't care about killing people. You don't really ask any many questions. You, you'll just do whatever you want for money. So come join our bandits. And then there's going to be a few grumbles from like the guy they let live who's like, oh yeah, but boss, they killed my brother <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> um, just to really 
to, to, to kind of tie it up a little bit to say, hey, that, those weren't just nameless mooks. They were part of something bigger. And that something bigger has taken notice of your sociopathic actions. Yeah, and yeah, no, I love it. This is where it. you find yourself. Yeah, what a great way to instill sort of a level of consequence into uh, the players and, you know, show that their actions matter. I, th I think that's awesome. I think um, uh, another thing that I enjoy sometimes is you can always infuse role-playing into your combats. And, you know, I think one of the things that makes people feel like murder hobos is that the consequences of their actions, you know, don't really matter or mm -hmm. they are always positive. And so... You know, I think if you want to make things, it's kind of dark, and but if you want to make them really feel it, when they do kill that bandit, you know, take a moment to say, when you, you strike down, you cut down the bandit, your sword, they, you watch them collapse onto the ground. The, the bandit boss looks over and uses his reaction to scream, Smith, no! Mm -hmm. And suddenly yeah. these, these things start to have, you know, um, repercussions. And then the other thing, too, is having enemies... Uh, run or surrender to during combat is a great way to um, you know infuse that role playing into the combat, and also once the dramatic question once the dramatic question of is there still danger in this combat is over, once that that's already been answered, you know we've all fought the monster where we've killed all the guys except for two when they're low, and then we you know we have to go through the rigmarole of having a couple rounds where we yeah, you know finish dice. the comp. Yeah, and it's, like, boring because we know, mm. okay, we've got this combat in the bag. Just have it end. Just, you know, have them surrender. Have them run. Or depending on your DM style, you can always say, oh, hey, they're they're out of hit points now. Your your players don't know how many hit points they have. So, mm -hmm. But really making it so that, you know, those consequences are there. And like you said, with the with the bandit and having them join that bandit group, I, I think that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, looking forward to Because obviously they're going to be like, Oh god, here we go again. I cast magic missile. I cast fireball. But the guy's going to be like, no, no, no. I want to. I want to. I want you to help us. Like, <laughs> you guys are evil. Like, come and <laughs> come and work for us, and you'll get money and this, that, the other. So then, lean into that part of them, which is like, okay, I don't mind being a bit outside of the law. Talking of earlier on, resource use. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we talked about a few like potions and spell, spell slots being the obvious one mm -hmm. but then also class abilities time as a resource now i talked about it a lot funnily enough in the episode of called time mm -hmm. but you and i talked already about it of how it's you know if they fight something and they have to rest that's an hour that's gone do you think that time is always part of that dramatic question always part of that you know there's, there's always something that is important to the players and and needs to be heavily considered and it's is is almost important enough that it can be a resource cost in of itself yeah it really depends on the group in my opinion because you know different players of games have different things that they that they want to pay attention to and are important to them interestingly um there was some game design study where they they looked at time pressure on people and some people just absolutely hate being time pressured I, particularly when somebody's a new gamer or is new to the table that level of time pressure really grates on people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I DM for a group that is a little bit newer, a little bit uh, more inexperienced. And for them, I wouldn't put that kind of time pressure on them because that would make them feel stressed out. In the group I play in right now, or differently in the group I play in, uh, that group, the time pressure is more meaningful for them, for us, because we're kind of more, more gaming, kind of uh, a little more experienced. However, in early on before I joined, I joined the campaign a little bit later on, and in the first, you know, few levels that they had, there was a, the DM put a time pressure on them, and they actually skipped past a lot of stuff that the DM kind of had wanted them to go and uh, do, which they just kind of totally blew past because they were like, "Oh, we we can't waste time for this right now." Yeah. And so the it kind of it can give it, it can take it. I think it really depends on the tone you're shooting for and what you you know, thinking about what's important for your group and what mix of things you want to bring in to get that level of tone is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. That's a nice balanced response there. And uh, what a balanced segue into my next question <laughs> was balancing non-combat encounters. So I'm sure most listeners are aware that obviously combat encounters are balanced by their kind of very nature, by challenge rating and XP and so on. But obviously... Social encounters uh, are obviously a bit trickier 
to balance. So what school of thought are you when it comes to balancing social encounters? Are you the school that says, oh, that's about 15? Does he roll persuasion and does he beat 15? Or are you the one that says, okay, no, if he rolls, you know, five lower, it pushes the the disposition of the person one step away. And if he rolls five higher, it pushes the disposition closer and that kind of stuff. How do you deal with judging and balancing and setting non-combat encounters? Yeah. When I think of non-combat encounters, there's also a number of other things that I think of as kind of non-combat encounters. But for social things in particular, what I like to do is I, uh, it's kind of a series, kind of of arguments that get somebody to either believe or disbelieve. And then having those persuasion checks kind of at a critical moment, you know, there might be three of them during a, during a conversation or two of them, because I don't think you should have a conversation and then kind of just roll a die and mm. then see, you know, does he, does this person believe you kind of thing? Yeah. I think the thing to do is kind of see during the conversation, how it's going, especially if it's a longer critical conversation um, or convincing a group of people or something like that, mm -hmm. because it just makes it feel more, I think, realistic to me. Although the thing I would warn against is having the same character roll that same persuasion again and again and again, again mm -hmm. which sometimes parties will want to do to min max. Um, you know, and if that happens, I would probably change the strategy. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think it makes it feel more dynamic. And the other thing I would say is when you do these persuasion checks, one of the things I would make, I would try to lean on more heavily is rather than saying, this is how persuasive you are when you have a role, is say, this is how the outcome falls on this person. Because one thing that is not fun in D&D &D is to have the characters abilities be limited by the dice they roll it's very undercuts how they feel yeah. so you know having it be the outcome based on the other party like oh you talk to them and you're very persuasive but they're having a bad day so they don't listen to you as much um or you know you i wouldn't say it like that they would say something like that where it, it doesn't undermine the players yeah you flipped the blame almost to yeah put it on to put it on this you know person yeah. this npc rather than their beloved player character yeah, and in a similar fashion, and this is, I've been tangenting all over, but to continue that theme, when I have a player in my combats, my players never miss an attack. Like, they very rarely actually miss mm -hmm. uh, when I describe an attack. You know, you swing to attack the goblin, but he raises his sword and blocks it in time. Yeah. Or, you know, that's so much more interesting and it makes the players feel less undermined when you know or you you would you hit the goblin but your sword uh, hits his scale mail and slides off unable to score uh you know unable yeah. to, to strike his flesh kind of thing yeah the, the word miss is shorthand for doesn't deal damage or you know, yeah. doesn't it doesn't affect the creature because of course yeah. hp isn't really a numerical figure it's fighting energy yeah and in the same way i would just encourage that uh, if a persuasion check fails, it's, you know, you haven't, uh, you know, it just, he doesn't believe you, she doesn't believe you for whatever reason, or <laughs> they, they have a different approach rather than you weren't persuasive. So. Yeah, I am need to get better at personally for me, you know, saying to use the combat encounter. Uh, yes, I usually thematically describe how they, you know, they bring the shield up or it hits the armor and, and just misses a, a major artery or something. But I still just out of habit say, you know when they say there's a 16 here and i go oh, that's not good enough i need to get out of the habit of saying that's not good enough because it really sets the wrong kind of theme and feel so that's uh something i need to work on but it's in the, the same school of saying they don't miss they still hit yeah. it's just this person has kind of outwitted them in this particular instance yeah and it's okay for them to miss if it's like a you know once in a while mm -hmm. like especially if they roll very low you can also have that person narrate how they miss it can be a fun way for them to say you know how do you miss and then they say oh i can almost shoot an arrow next to grogar's head and mm -hmm. you know then they can kind of play take more ownership of it mm -hmm. um but either way yeah and the same breath as you're alluding to earlier on around social encounters and the dice basically saying what happens dictating what happens i absolutely agree it's no fun especially if you have like the character who's who's been built to be the face of the party and they step forward all ready ready to rock and roll and they just go please give us a discount now <laughs> and because the dice have dictated you know have said that they're they've fumbled on their persuasion check so yeah i it's much better to say they were still eloquent and they still politely asked for a discount 
but the store owner has said, actually, taxes have just risen, so I can't give you discounts because... My, my profit margins are being squeezed. Yeah, and by the same token, you know, when the the eight persuasion barbarian walks up and says, "Give me a discount, please," sometimes it does work. And so, you know, yeah. uh, you know, I've had that happen in real life, where you know, once in a while, you'll ask for something and you miraculously you'll get it, and it feels like you crit that situation. And uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes you just hit the person on the right day. Mm, so. Mm. so that's that's uh, after all of that, your your answer was basically a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, a nice, nice political answer. Yeah, unfortunately, I think a lot of these will probably be that. But I think the the I think why that's an exciting answer for DMs is because it really lets you design as you play, and it lets you take ownership of the process. Like DMing is so much more game design and has so much more room for game design than I think people realize. Like I think people think of game design as this thing where you have to go out and make an rpg or you have to like make a board game or make a video mm. game even small you know even a one-on-one D D session that's you being a game designer in real time and so uh you know i think i think it's it actually provides a lot of opportunity for you to sort of choose and craft it to be perfect or you know mm -hmm. maybe not perfect but to be better yeah it's that in situ dynamic balancing act that is one reason that I'm attracted to DMing. It's that having the macro and the micro, like a, it's, a, it's like a million micro decisions are happening in a very short space of time, which all impact yeah. the macro around it. Like, okay, they've all persuasion. Was it good enough? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, but how does it affect and how much does the price go down and what does that mean? And, and so on and so on and so on. And how does that affect the other players and the other character wanted to roll for persuasion and should I let him roll again? All of that stuff is is the juicy bit that, really excites me when i'm yeah. dming uh, and is obviously some of the trickiest stuff <laughs> to yeah, get right yeah. of course yeah i mean it's a i think that's one of the the fun things about the craft is that uh you know it's something that has almost infinite depth and so mm. it's it's really fun to uh think of game design in a way of itself as a game for the dm so mm. and also it's 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 a uniquely human experience D D as well like you can't yes the framework's been designed at a computer you know probably helped by spreadsheets to do some of the numbers and stuff but the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay again the difference between this and video games is that it's only ever one way aside from multiplayer games for an example but it's always this 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 permanent two-way flow of mm -hmm. human emotion essentially so one thing that really I have to consider when doing a non-combat encounter to definitely bring us back on topic yeah. <laughs> is, uh, is what I was talking about earlier on of, of like, if one person's been doing a lot of the talking and maybe they don't want to having to be like as the NPC, well, what about you over there in the corner? Why aren't you talking to kind of bring in other people who might need a bit of a springboard or to stop people from rolling and rolling and rolling, you know, introducing other things or, if they've yeah. been, you know, there's just, there's just a number of so many different things you need to consider about the impact of on not just the player that's making the role, how that affects not only the other characters, but also the other players at the table who are just like every human subject to envy or frustration or jealousy. So it's it's super tr tricky. <laughs> yeah, or boredom when, you know, they Indeed. sit and the party face goes. But if we think about, you know, a conversation, if there's, you know, a group of four people walks up to one person and starts talking to them, it's not like <laughs> the one person just stand, you know, sits, sits there and talks or the other three people just stand there waiting for five minutes. You know, the hell yeah. natural would that be? So No, no I was just going to say, like, you could just imagine, if, like, if that was me, I'd be like, who are the other two guys and why are they here? us? <laughs> Yeah, and it's a great opportunity to force, like, uh, you know, earlier I was saying that d and I think it's really interesting when you have to kind of apply your skills in a way that don't work. Like, if the, the bard rolls, you know, let's say the bard has a plus 10 persuasion or plus 12 persuasion, which, you know, not too far-fetched. Mm -hmm. um, social encounters aren't going to be interesting when he just walks up and says, you know, hey, I'm the bard, give me a discount and then he rolls you know a 25 or whatever every time it's like okay you know yeah that ceases to be interesting but when that conversation happens and the barbarian has to make those choices or the barbarian has to go 
you know, seduce the person at the ball or get the invitation to the party or convince the king of something. That's when D&D gets much more interesting. And so I think really involving the characters who aren't in the social situation and challenging them to be social in certain situations Mm -hmm. is a great way to do that. And you can either have the character uh, address you know, the people who aren't speaking. You can have a, th- a second NPC approach and start engaging some of those characters. Mm. There's all, all sorts of things you could do to get them involved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Before we move on to combat encounters then, mm-hmm. is there any anything else you want to talk about around everything but combat? <laughs> yeah, I um, I mean, honestly, I, could, I feel like we could spend a whole <laughs> a whole session on each, each different one. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of different things that could be... Um, like we've touched on skill challenges, we've touched on social. One other one, especially for low-level parties that I really enjoy is um, exploration or environmental encounters. It's kind of odd to think of these as encounters sometimes, but they do use up resources, particularly for low levels. You know, when players are level one to five, you know, that first tier, mm-hmm. they don't have access to flight. Even things like dark vision, you know, D and D five E gives dark vision to everybody. But if you didn't have it, trying to explore via torchlight, mm-hmm. that has a cost. But I think there's a number of things that you can do in encounters you can build that really will engage your players, and especially players who are newer and are more tentative around combat. This can be a great way to engage them. So during a dungeon quarrel, I would really recommend having exploration segments in there. So one example of this would be um, uh, I had my players exploring a jungle dungeon, Mm -hmm. and uh, they come to uh, a shaft where it's a 50-foot tall, 10 by 10 room. At the bottom, there's sand. There's two vines hanging down, and so they look. There's a uh, there's like a doorway up at the top. So they'll need to get across this big pit and then climb up the other side. This gives them an opportunity to really try to use their abilities to sort of get through this because, you know, if they fail and fall, then that's going to have consequences. And uh, Mm. when this encounter happened, when I kind of threw this at my players, first of all, one of the vines was a snake. So, you know, the player went to go grab it. It was a snake. They drop into the quicksand. Um, But they use, you know, they try to use enlarge to try and grab onto the wall better. Enlarge Mm. reduce the enlarge part. And so that used a spell slot, a second level spell slot for a, you know, fourth level party or whatever that has a real cost. Yeah. Um, And then also... When you present these challenges to players, it lets them sort of tackle it however they want, rather than combat where it's very, uh, you know, you have a series of skills you can use and you have to use one of these particular skills. So I think those kinds of exploration, environmental encounters can be really great. Higher level parties, you know, once you get to level 11 and everybody can fly and shoot lasers and you <laughs> yeah. know, do all sorts of things, it's not as challenging. But I think for lower level parties, that's where that really shines. So, mm-hmm. And that's probably one thing to talk about later on is how to keep challenging elements in there because at lower levels, just just talking your way into a city can be a challenge. Just the guards might not be, as we said earlier, having a bad day and just, you know, them being like, what the hell are you doing with all these weapons on you <laughs> is, is, you know, could be challenging enough when they're, as we said, like level 11 up, basically all trivial day-to-day activities are just not pointless but just mean very little to the party characters because at uh, certain, certain party characters because they are just so easy to to brute force past with the dice so trying to i don't know what i don't know really where i sit like should you just accept that is the fate of an adventuring party and just say yeah like they're gonna walk into a bar and everyone's gonna know them and throw free drinks at them because they're level 15 and that's yeah what it means to be level 15 or do you say <laughs> the bars the bars full of monsters now that <laughs> <laughs> yeah how many dragons are there in the kingdom this like yeah it's a great it's a great question um i think that there's there's sort of three things about this topic the first of which is kind of a kind of a sad point but the uh, honestly uh, the answer for a lot of these is that most campaigns don't get there mm-hmm. um and so to worry too much about it in advance is something that uh you know, most something like ninety percent of campaigns. Wizards has published data on this. Like ninety percent of campaigns don't get past level ten or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a similar chart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't remember the details off the top of my head, but mm-hmm. you know, so I think that as DMs, it's really easy for us to really worry about um, 
those sorts of situations. But then how often do they happen? Uh, the other, so, you know, to some extent, I guess, you know, the, the answer is, especially when you're starting off, don't, don't sweat it too much. Mm -hmm. The other two answers I have is one changing the rest, like I said, changing the resting mechanic, especially as they get higher level and putting that time crunch, then that expenditure of resources becomes more impactful. To some extent, they should earn it. You know, if they come into a bar and they're the best bard in the world, you know, like if, yeah, David, people, you know, people are going to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, can you imagine if you were at a bar and Lady Gaga walked in, you'd be like, okay, here's some free drinks, Lady Gaga. Like, like, please sing. <laughs> like, it would be, you know, a whole event. The other thing, too, that I, I, I think I like to put in my games is uh, in my current campaign, my players, I don't think, are there yet, but the players who are high level aren't the first players in the world to be high level. And there's mm. all sorts of crazy broken stuff that players at high, you know, PCs at high level can do. And I think thinking about what the heroes who have tread the world before and the villains who have been in the world before have done to the world and what power they've accumulated and what they've left behind are really interesting ways to think about how to challenge the players. I think, you know, I think if it is a truly a mundane event that the players are dealing with, yeah, they should be able to just roll past it. They've become a certain level where they're the heroes of the realm, they're in third tier, you know, yeah, bribing the guards or telling getting a discount or you know slaying the goblins not a problem but mm -hmm. then i think that's where having those kind of high level play uh higher harder encounters there are still a lot of opportunities for that to still be interesting and they should be you know the challenge at high level definitely does the the challenges are differ for sure but i think something you can do in advance is a don't worry about it too much b put a, just a little bit of thought in advance about what those kind of will look like in your campaign and then, you know, start to prepare for that. Especially if it involves going to uh, dangerous areas. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Tasha has a bunch of great stuff about dangerous um, dangerous magical environments. Those are great ways to challenge the players. Um, you know, going through deserts, trying to travel to dif distant locations. Those are still challenging things for high-level players, especially before they get teleport. But even with teleport, you know, if you don't know where you're going, that's going to be kind of tricky. Mm -hmm. So there's still definitely ways to challenge those parties. Mm -hmm. yeah those those in tashes i really want to try and incorporate in some way i think it's a nice interesting way as you said a, a different way of challenging and you know because it's, it's almost brand spanking new i know it's been homebrewed probably in a million different campaigns but it, it would also work against the players that know what a boulette is and know what a basilisk is and know what <laughs> you know a, yeah. a, a black ooze is and stuff they'll go oh what the heck is this i don't even and it, it, it helps them to embody their character a little bit more who's also going w what is this <laughs> yeah yeah i i actually really and that's that uh, that variety is really important because it's important to have variety of your encounters you know have different ki types of encounters but also having a variety of monsters that your players fight both your pcs fight and your players fight that way your players aren't bored when they say okay it's another basilisk i know don't mm -hmm. look it in the eyes um you know and i think that can be a really fun place for dms to homebrew and change things up is monster mm -hmm. abilities and you can go online and there's plenty of um, materials you know stuff online to find about monsters that put people put out there and then having those kinds of different challenges can be really ways to make things you know that variety is the spice of life and so i think that you know when designing combat encounters it's just something to keep in mind thank you for that perfect segue <laughs> into combat encounters then so mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about those so I guess as a start for 10, we've mentioned the word 101 times already. So balancing combat encounters. And again, this is a bit of a political statement in that it's it depends on <laughs> so many different circumstances yeah. and the context and the group at the table and, and so on and so on. But obviously I use uh, encounter builders for yeah. mine um, mm -hmm. because there's no way I'm doing that maths. Uh, <laughs> I, I attempted like twice and yeah. just thought, man, this is... Uh, there's going to be an easier way <laughs> to do this than yeah. add the multiplication, divide by the players, but there's more enemies. And it's yeah. a, a, an encounter builder basically relieved all that pain. Yeah. It's definitely an art to building encounters because sure. there's so many Absolutely. different, there's a million different um, levers there that I think that, especially when you start out and 
you just think, okay, I'll throw two bugbears at them or something. Mm-hmm. But there's so much more. Um, there's a lot of other tools you can use in balancing encounters. And you can also do, there's a lot of tools and tricks you can do to kind of live balance encounters. Mm-hmm. I think when starting out from sort of the monster angle, there's a couple things I would recommend for DMs to really think about, which is one, having a variety of enemy types is really important. Mm. And uh, number two, when you're building an encounter, thinking about how those monsters work together and what um, how dangerous those can be to the players in concert, I think is really important. You know, if you have like a single basilisk, that can just petrify a person. And so that can be a really dangerous thing for a party, almost more dangerous than... Uh, you know, let's say I don't remember what a basilisk CR is. I think it's two. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that might be more dangerous or deadly to a party because you know, if you have a level two party, they can't really deal with petrification very well. Versus, you know, two bugbears, which I think are, you know, let's say an owlbear is a CR two. I don't remember without mm-hmm. having it in front of me. But if you know, two owlbears is a very challenging encounter, but that's a more controllable encounter in some ways. Yeah, where, for sure. Yeah, where it's not just gonna, you know one shot the players you a lot of those kind of save or die spells uh, effects can be very dangerous uh, banshee whales and being another one that I, yeah. that I think people overlook this is something that uh, jamie and i touched on in mistakes was due to the mistakes we made building encounters for the exact reason that you've just described and i i remember when i read the dungeon master's guide and the player's handbook and i don't ever recall it making a bigger deal it was all very much like mm-hmm. here are the numbers cr2 is 500 xp a medium encounter is a thousand and it all mm-hmm. seems very black and white quite easy okay well that we that will be a challenge and it has never been a challenge like i can't i can't think of a medium encounter that's been what i would consider a medium difficulty combat and it's because of those other facets the the, the example jamie and i use is the strength drain that i think it's shadows get yeah shadows. that can also just kill an NPC yep. I don't even think they get a save apart from the save to reduce their strength but when it hits zero they just die <laughs> yeah <laughs> like yeah. I think they're like CR half or maybe one and a half or something but it's it's just it's just like oh that that, that, that was an easy encounter but I've, I've killed two players Oops. yeah well and especially <laughs> When you get into, um, you know, the more monsters, with because of bounded accuracy in the D20 mm-hmm, system, mm-hmm. Uh, generally, if you want to make encounters easier, having less monsters makes it easier for the players, and having more weaker monsters can make it harder for the players, just because of bounded accuracy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you might have eight shadows is attacking a party of level two, and I think they're CR one-fourth or something, and, you know, yes, that's yeah, a yeah. very difficult encounter. So the there's really kind of a lot more depth into developing encounters Mm -hmm. than just even when starting just looking at the CR numbers there's a lot to play around with there you know something that I like to do in order to um, attenuate this is I do like to give some of these monsters different abilities so for example uh, for shadows I think they can be very fun to use but having them use strength drain every turn is probably a little much Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that I recently did with my party is I had the shadows touch the player's weapons and have them become immaterial like they'd be turned into shadowy weapons that like fell to the floor and mm-hmm. they couldn't use their weapons you know it's probably honestly not as strong as a strength drain attack but that variety can surprise players especially experienced players when you give mm-hmm. a monster a new ability like that it makes it a little less deadly and it actually scared the crap out of some of my players particularly the newer ones who thought that that was a very large threat mm. um so that's also something where you can do where we're, you know, harkens back to making sure that there's a variety is you can change monster abilities in order to up or lower the CR a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I agree. And I really like that idea of making the weapons immaterial because it makes a, I mean, the strength drain is, I guess, equally a bigger deal because obviously for the martial classes, that's, and the sure a rogue, that's going to directly impact how effective you are but then also for the caster classes their strength is typically going to be a lot lower anyway mm-hmm. so they've got f- <laughs> they've got a lower distance to fall before they yeah. die anyway so um yeah so yeah having that immaterial thing especially if the caster's focus is is a weapon like a staff yeah. or a mace or something then they're doubly screwed <laughs> yeah well what i had happen was um there was a cleric who was using 
her longsword to get the shadows, and then, you know, she still has her cantrips. Uh, I think that, you know, it, the goal wouldn't be to disable a player entirely. Yes. But yeah, as yeah. they get to a higher level, then forcing them to use those backup things, mm. that can be a better challenge. Um, it kind of, you know, once again, depends on the player group, but it can force them to think in a different way and play in a different mm -hmm. way. I think in the similar situation, crowd control effects like stuns are something that you want to avoid more layering on your players, but then having conditional crowd control effects and or limiting effects on your players does force them to think out of the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I read recently that basically stun is A, a little bit OP because yeah. they lose a whole turn, but also yeah. probably more importantly, it sucks as a player. Yeah, very anti-fun. Um, yeah. You know, back back in the old days of WoW, for example, uh, World of Warcraft, you know, there were rogues mm -hmm. that could... Uh, uh, stun luck. Yep, and that's <laughs> that's exactly the... Uh, you know, I think it's fine when the PCs do it to monsters, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's not very fun. It's definitely a, an anti-fun situation when your PCs get stunned. So that's another thing where, you know, you could have a lot of low-level monsters that have a CC effect. That can be another challenge to ramp up, you know, encounters it can make the encounter more difficult mm -hmm. even with the same sort of level of cr let's say mm -hmm. yeah i my main was a warlock in wow so i am intimately familiar with rogues <laughs> and their stun locks so yeah. yes yeah. yeah i've got a very good example this is hot off the presses because i ran the session on thursday long story short is i was rerunning a chapter that i'd run in my main campaign now, when the players went through that in my main campaign, they were level four, five, maybe. So I was I stepped in over Christmas to to run it for another group of friends, and I said, "Hey, let me give the DM a break. I'll jump in. I've got this chapter. I'll just rerun the chapter. There's very little overhead for me. I just mm -hmm. got to basically redesign the the encounters." The guys in this one, uh, I said, "You know, have have some fun. Be level eleven, level ten, something like that, just to have a bit more flexibility." And for the most part, it was okay. Uh, I managed to scale up combat encounters and still keep it congruent mm -hmm. within reason. And then this is the thing that I want people to learn from, from my mistake, and it came to the, the big boss battle. Mm -hmm. So my point being is that I managed to scale up the CR to an equivalent hard fight for player characters of twice the level. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. I didn't scale the encounter, the wider encounter, yeah. So it's still quite a two-dimensional fight because the players that went through it originally were lower level, lower experience in real life. So it was still very much like, here's a big bad, here's a couple of mooks, go to town. So not only are these players ever so slightly more experienced as players, but also their characters had a whole lot more. And although yep. the fight was technically hard, they have a lot more ways to make it trivial at level 11 yep. than they do at level 5. So it was... From a DM's perspective, the players enjoyed it, which is, I guess, the most important thing. But hey, I'm <laughs> always trying to do better. And um, it, it definitely felt like it had a little bit less threat, a little bit less yeah. dynamism than it did yeah. against level five players, just purely because it was like, oh, OK, I've got a kobold ranger literally just going toe to toe with this bad guy yeah. because he's got pack tactics and is hitting on a plus nine and is doing 20 points of damage. Oh, <laughs> especially if you, um, you know, players are min maxer, you know, D and D is designed and with the original way the rules were designed, at least per my understanding is that, you know, they kind of had planned for a pretty limited set of options. And so if somebody's really a min maxer too, the, the level of power that their character scales with as they level up is, mm. um, you know, it's exponential. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and then if you have a single boss monster, even with a couple of mooks, if you, even if they're taken out easily, suddenly that boss, you know, when everybody in the party can layer on CC, you know, the monk is stunning strike every turn, you know, the wizard's doing whatever banishment, hypnotic pattern, autos, mm -hmm. irresistible dance, whatever. All these layered effects, it kind of creates kind of another layer of combat where it's yeah. even above and beyond just the challenge rating of that situation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think when that happens, you know, the thing to think about is is uh, layering in some of these other encounter effects, you know, having terrain, having additional minions, having environmental effects, traps. Those are a great point for when you can throw those in because those kinds of things will add a lot of variety and kind of keep players uh, on their toes. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too, is um, because, you know, you can just, throw, like, if you have a 
higher level party throwing, you know, you would think using the encounter builder, you could just throw a, a Remoraz against them or something. But mm-hmm. even at that, when they get to a higher level, you almost need to uh, amp up the CR by double just to even make the players feel threatened. Mm-hmm. And so for a boss fight, I think that's really where you want to, uh, you know, put a lot of extra oomph in. Mm-hmm. There are also ways in which you can kind of live balance encounters um, kind of sneakily. Uh, you can have the extra reinforcements come in or have staged combats or have the boss decide which abilities to use or fight intelligently or not fight intelligently. So that does also give you a lot of levers for kind of uh, changing how the combats work. In real time mm-hmm. yeah you touched on a couple of points there and the, the funniest one is about the traps and the terrain mm-hmm. yeah and I'm, I'm doubly an idiot because when i originally run that encounter for the lower level characters i had basically the ground where they killed some spectral enemies turn into like void pits That's of awesome. you know you slip into the the abyss of yeah ethereal plane kind of thing because they yeah. kind of tore a hole in really for some reason forgot to do that when i reran it with the higher level characters and i was like why that's that's precisely what that encounter needed and <laughs> more so for these players and i forgot to do it yeah and you kind of have to ramp it up too based on the uh the level like for example one of the earlier combats that i threw at my party one of the traps in the room was a rug covering a pit you know easily oh, nice. very you know it was that was actually a very fun one, especially for low-level parties, because there was a lot of dirt around the room, and, you know, there was shovels, and there was, like, a rug that was very out of place in the room, <laughs> and then they, like, stepped on it during the comic encounter. I'm like, they're like, well, I, you know, I go over here. I'm like, well, you try to take a step, and you fall into the pit. That's obviously much more of an of a barrier for the lower level parties and once you get to those higher level parties you know a wall of fire ain't gonna really you know or like fire on the ground ain't gonna really cut it in terms of providing a barrier for them you know what are you gonna take when you run through fire 1d6 1d10 damage you know if you're a yeah 10th level you don't really care no and i think then is too when you have to work on scaling up the the barriers to the players along with the cr to make it you know keep it in lockstep yeah, as I said, the, the encounter as a whole of which yeah. the CR is just one part yeah. of it. So you could have an almost easy or trivial CR encounter, but because you've got seven different layers and rocks falling and yeah. rocks covering holes, it's actually overall <laughs> <laughs> a lot heavier. Yeah, and it, and it keeps it much more interesting. I mean, mm. even the distance at which your players start from an enemy, you know, if you have, like, if they're um, if they're fighting against, let's say, 10 kobold archers uh you know if they start that fight in melee piece of cake yes. if they are running up a set of stairs that are you know in a rain slick you know slick stairs and when the, it's raining during a storm and the kobolds have cover shooting from the castle windows that could be four kobold archers that's like a cr1 or whatever <laughs> cr2 that could that could be like a almost a huge challenge mm. for some parties you know even at a higher level so uh those kinds of levers i think there's just a lot of fun things you can do with combat mm. something that i like to do occasionally is that you can throw any even puzzles or rp things in combat so there's just so much opportunity you have there to kind of mix it up switch it up one fun thing i did recently i kind of have a in the campaign i run is a little more goofy a little more um fantastical mm-hmm. uh the players had a combat where there was a fire elemental in a, a like a a glass containment system and there were these there was like controls like levers around the room that were controlling these control rods and it was actually i take an inspiration from chernobyl where mm-hmm. you know the control rods were being lowered and raised yes. and the enemies were running around during the combat flipping some of them were attacking them some of them were running around flipping the levers you know willy-nilly and so the players had to deal with this sort of puzzle in the middle of combat in addition to fighting the enemies Mm -hmm. an encounter where i attack you attack i attack you attack the monster dies it's really going to be interesting but it's really Mm -hmm. all that set dressing that you add in that's where it takes it kind of to the next level yeah which is which is where it takes a lot of planning and prep on the dm i think to make to, you know, to go the extra mile and to make those engaging encounters that have an extra couple of dimensions be it time you know, yeah uh, you know the, the room's filling with water for example which can drastically change how combat works you know rolling yeah. at disadvantage moving half speed because you're wading through water that kind of stuff which is something i just made up then but now I definitely want to incorporate at some point because that sounds yeah. really interesting and 
Yeah, it's it's tricky. Yeah, there, there's even simple ones you could do though. Like it's not, um, you know, it does it does take more time. Depending, you know, this is kind of where, just like with the rest of DMing, the more time you want to spend, the more time you can spend. But one thing you can do is just have an easy, quick tool set of things you can grab real fast. Like you could say, the room is filling up with water. There's poisonous mm -hmm. gas in the room that might explode if it gets hit with fire. Uh, another one that I did was the characters have to like crawl through a tunnel and anybody who's medium who's medium or larger has to like bend down and has totally. to move at half speed and then there were gricks that came out so you know one thing you can do is just have a document ready of uh, combat complications you can add in and mm -hmm. that can infuse a little more life into an encounter even if it's something that you're trying to come up with on the fly and mm -hmm. having those different variety type of enemies in those encounters too really makes it feel alive you might have a situation where, you know, mimics are great for this too because they can act as traps. Characters might, you know, one character might be being attacked by a mimic. One character might be being attacked by a gelatinous cube. Yeah. You know, even that kind of simple comment of here's two different enemies suddenly can be a situation that becomes very memorable where it becomes, uh, you know, both of them kind of function as traps. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how many combats against 10 goblins is memorable. It's really kind of those more interesting ones that really I feel like stick out in our minds. You're making me feel really good about myself because. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I mean, it's not to say that somebody's failing when they don't do these things, but I think it's really exciting for us as DMs and game designers to be able to uh, invest more and mm. really make things stick out. And you know, the, I think you had a recent episode about adding music and that can be another mm. one too. There's uh, yeah, the, va the value added stuff, isn't it? It's it's the above yeah. and beyond kind of just to really put a polish on it. Yeah. Yeah. Cuz um yeah, one of the reason I said that thing was because the combat I had in the same dungeon with the boss battle I was just talking about is a mimic and a couple of black puddings. Mm -hmm. And the mimic in that instance was it wasn't basically a chest. It was basically pretending to be the elevator in the elevator shaft. So the player's <laughs> yeah. like, the first time a player steps on, I'm like, oh, the floors, like it looks like wood, but it's kind of sticky. And you're, you're, you're having to, like, it's almost pulling your shoes off as you walk. And then I basically get them to roll initiative because the yeah. lift starts to eat the players. And then long story short, they kill the mimic. And what's left is like this proper rickety wooden <laughs> lift whereas before it was you know with like f posters and metal and gantries and barricades and stuff uh, yeah and then now what's left is like hanging by a thread <laughs> <laughs> i love that that's great i'm gonna steal that <laughs> <laughs> and they're providing you know value adding in this podcast uh, yeah, yeah. with ideas to each other and the oh, that's a good point actually the other thing i wanted to say was you mentioned there again the other thing that was boosting my ego was about having tunnels that characters have to move at half speed through mm -hmm. and i incorporated those into a pretty run-of-the-mill kobold dungeon that listeners mm -hmm. would have heard me talk about before it's probably my uh, magnum opus to date of dungeon design mm -hmm. but my point being is that that's people can use that if they have time to design a lot of those things you were talking about a lot of those go-to's so i've got the tunnels in there um like murder holes, traps, you know, explosive mm -hmm. traps to attract um, so the, the kobolds in this dungeon. They have a kiln that they were using to build and tinker and stuff. Mm -hmm. But basically they, they slam it into overdrive so it explodes, mm -hmm. attracting basilisks and the uh, little insect creatures. I can't remember the name. Yeah, um, Sturges? No, the big, the bigger ones that are like... Onkegs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of different... <laughs> it's, it's yeah, hard. there's a, there's a, there's a lot of them, of yeah. Um, yeah. And... Um, so people could, without the restraint of the campaign they're building, if they just want to throw together like their perfect dungeon, just by doing that, you can get those, oh, maybe there's a room over here that would be fun if it had that. And maybe it might not make sense in that dungeon, but then it's given you that toolbox, as you were saying, to, to pick and choose. Yeah. And you can always throw in another complication. Like you can either, I think this kind of is a, you know, sort of, sort of bottom up or top down design. You can either... Um... You know, you can build a dungeon around a key encounter, which can be a very fun way to do it. Or you can just throw in some random challenges for, you know, a very run-of-the-mill encounter. You could have, you know, if you're fighting goblins in a field, a lightning storm that strikes random tiles suddenly makes this combat feel like, ooh, <laughs> suddenly the characters are very, you know, on edge. You know, if they're swinging, you know, you can describe them swinging their metal swords around about in the rain with lightning striking in this yeah. field. 
I just thinking of Breath of the Wild now, Legend of Zelda yeah. Breath of the Wild. Like, I can just imagine the players just throwing their swords at the goblins to be like, pick them up, pick them up, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they can get shocked yeah. by lightning. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think even if you don't have the time to, you know, we all have busy lives with a lot to do, sure. you don't have the time to um, flesh out an encounter to, you know, make it exactly perfect. You can always uh, just throw in a little thing, and that will help to. Uh, mm-hmm a small yeah. detail that you can just flavor it a little bit yeah yeah, yeah yeah even if it's just you know rough terrain you know double yeah half movement is tricky enough for some yeah or classes. cover half cover full mm. cover traps have your bandits have bear traps around the woods and then when the you know players are skulking through the bushes maybe they step on a bear trap yeah half half cover and full cover is something i don't uh, utilize as much as i should I haven't read Sun Tzu any time recently, so it's it's not really at the, the <laughs> forefront of my mind to you know have the the people hide behind tree trunks or battlements to gain that plus two or plus five or whatever it is. Yeah, I did a recent encounter that I quite liked that I called the um, the Scooby Doo encounter, where <laughs> um, there was a series of six rooms, and some of the rooms had. Uh, torches that the enemies could pull and there were like revolving walls and so the <laughs> the players would run into a room like they would see the kobold run into the room close the door and then flip the room and then they'd run into the room and the kobold wouldn't be there and they were like what the heck is happening so you can always have enemies like skulk off especially if they duck behind cover they could just mm-hmm. run to a different room and that can be a surprising different element too mm-hmm. oh man i'm definitely using that that sounds like super fun i mean i've been super evil here just to mess with the players I'm like... <laughs> yeah you well that one too i mean you that's another one where you can also um you can change it some dms will change things on the fly others won't you know you could have them mm-hmm. uh run into a room and leave an illusionary copy that the player fights you could have them run, send them an illusion of them running into a room and then there's a bear trap in that room yeah um there was a lot of different things you can do with that one but the revolving walls one is a really fun one i i recommend people try yeah and i've uh, got to i'm gonna steal that to a flammable gas yeah because as a part in my cobalt dungeon is their like mushroom farm where they would get mm-hmm. their food and stuff and it's not mm-hmm. too much of a stretch of imagination to say the air is thick with like underground gases and spores and stuff yeah. that make it you know flammable or poisonous to, to a certain extent so yeah i'm definitely gonna remix that you could uh, i think there might be in um the lost minds of flan found mm-hmm. deviler where there's mm-hmm. the um i i'm not sure if this is actually in the adventure um but the mushrooms also release spores that are toxic if a player speaks or you can have fire effects you know make that make them light or all sorts of things like mm. that so or loud noises cause them to you know send out toxic spores yeah yeah i think there's going to be a few uh myconids down there <laughs> Which will be a, t- a test, a moral test of my players' murder hoboness to see whether they kill them, these yeah. benign mushroom people, or not. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, we've we've really blitzed through just so many different ways to embellish combat encounters, and it's a bit of a shame that, as I said earlier on, that like when I was reading the book as a a newer DM, you're just like, oh, okay this is how you make an encounter. You plug this monster in and then you plug that monster in and it becomes an encounter. When in reality, there's just so many more facets. You you, you could even have one monster that is unreachable and the encounter mm-hmm. is just trying to get to them. <laughs> yeah, or you can have encounters that are uh, multi-staged. You know, one, one encounter I did was I had a kobold playing a weird bagpipe and he wasn't attacking the players but the music was keeping a hook horror asleep and then or you know afraid and so then it you know then that that becomes an encounter too where the you have these conditional encounters where something can happen that triggers a fight um yeah at the end of the day there's so many different ways you can modify and make them interesting and i think even just throwing in a couple of these things will really help to add variety and i think that's that's really the key to it yeah the uh this isn't even my final form trope <laughs> is uh something i have utilized uh, yeah before and is is fun but obviously don't overuse it because then the players will plan accordingly and uh yeah. <laughs> save all their novaness for phase two but then that's when you have phase three come in and uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean depending on how Depending on how you your personal philosophy as a DM, you can always uh, change things live if that's what you believe in. You know, they pull out the the potion of giant size or whatever yeah. that they just magically had. So, yeah. But in 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 reality, I'm well, it might be unsurprising, but I'm very much a person who is happy to remix things on the fly 
because mm-hmm. I am of the school of thought that any encounter is there to be interesting and fun. Yeah. And yes, I get it that it's is it can be fun in of itself to trivialize an encounter. Mm-hmm. I, I get it. But on the same hand, like some almost need to be threatening or need to be mm-hmm. a pain in the backside. And so if it looks like it's swinging too much the other way because the roles have taken it that way, essentially, then I am very much a person who will, you know, buff, you know, maybe round down the damage that the players do to the nearest 10 or, mm-hmm. you know, bump up the HP and, and just say, ah, you can probably take another hit. I'll let the killing blow be the next hit. Just, just to give him another round in combat. Yeah. And that's that's all it can take. Like, one more round can be the... Can make the difference between... Ah, we're, this is all right, we're walking this, to... Oh, man, he really did a big number there, and that person's nearly dead, and can really change the the flavour of, of the combat. So, yeah, that's... Yeah, I tend to I tend to be more on your side of things, where I, I tend to like to tweet things occasionally, normally in the player's favor, if uh-huh. I feel like a combat's going too long, but I know some DMs swear by not, you know, by trying to be um, objective yeah, in how yeah, they kind of run Yeah, there's definitely encounters. a school of thought, which is like, yeah. the numbers are the numbers, and I'm not changing them, they exist yeah. for a purpose, and, and that, that's one way of, of playing, and I, I, get, I appreciate the, the purity of it it just removes so much ambiguity i kind of appreciate the the yeah Yeah, the flexibility yeah i think even if you are of that mindset where you say okay well here's how it's going to go for this encounter you can always change to the next encounter or there's there's also other things you can do um to change you know if the monsters fight smarter or not or you know the players don't know what spells the monsters have or Mm. what abilities so there are things you can do to um even if you set your encounter in advance and you say this is the encounter i'm not changing the statistics there's still a lot you can do to actually um curve and adjust the difficulty live depending on how you feel Mm -hmm. so um you know in general i try to have the monsters fight smart but um, if you really are afraid of a TPK coming, you can always have them play a little dumber. Mm-hmm. But uh, Or the other thing you can do, too, is you can have your monsters roll intelligence checks mid-combat to see how well they fight. That's another option, too, where that way it's more um, deterministic in the game world. Mm. Yeah, that's one way. It's not mm, not the way I, I, I would like to run it. Yeah, not my yeah. way either, but I'm just trying to provide tools that, you know, just... Sure, yeah, no, I get it. Again, it's the same, you know, yeah, it's, it's the same as, you know, running it by the numbers and just letting the yeah. numbers talk. Yeah, that, that's a nice way of doing it. I mean, actually, let me rephrase, like, especially in complicated encounters when there's a million and one things going off. Actually, I've changed my tune because... I'm just thinking about the last combat encounter I ran off my main session and was just drowning in numbers and rolls and <laughs> HP. So actually, yeah, on second yeah. thoughts, yeah, just being like, okay, he runs. And actually, I'm a total huge liar because I literally did that. I, I just said I don't, I wouldn't do it that way, and literally, I've done it that way uh, in the past. So yeah, I think <laughs> I think it all depends on your group, and you can adjust. It's your own style, your group style, and yeah. at the end of the day, I think the takeaway is that there's just a lot of depth here to do it however you want. That isn't addressed in the monster manual, or it isn't addressed in the DMG, isn't addressed in the player's handbook. Mm. You know, I'm with, I'm kind of more on your side where I kind of address things on the fly. But even if you don't do that, it's uh, there's still a lot of options out there. Is there is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Well, this is going to be a stupid question because the answer I know already is yes. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> for today's podcast, uh, was there anything burning you you wanted to talk about encounters? I think I have. You know, maybe maybe we can have another one and have some more discussion about some of the other sort of tips and tricks. Um, mm-hmm. I guess the only other thing too I would throw in for people to also think about. Um, Puzzles can be encounters, chases can be encounters, Mm -hmm. and stealth sections can also be encounters. Um, And you can also weave these things into combat to uh, keep things fresh. You know, a Mm. stealth mission that goes wrong, where it falls into combat, that you're trying to keep stealthy, that can be a real fun one. Chases where you have bandits attacking you on the way as you're trying to chase down the person uh that can be also very fun and i would just encourage players to um kind of think outside of the box when it comes to what an encounter means and Mm. or you know you can have somebody uh 
a social encounter where you need to take somebody alive and you have to convince them to stop fighting you, those kinds of things. Is There's just a lot more variation out there, and you can always play with the rules mm -hmm. and adjust the rules as you go to kind of uh, add a lot of more a lot more variety and a lot more interesting, plausible scenarios rather than I attack, he attack, I attack, monster mm -hmm. dies. Oh, more bandits. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What we're saying is don't see the rules as a, an inhibitor. Yes. See them as part of your toolkit to generate unique and interesting things. And the rules, yeah. not just of encounters, but of the entire game of social interactions, of chases, of this, that, and the other, of vehicle control if you're chasing in you know horse and carts some gta style section you know <laughs> use the tools as uh, the, you grand know. theft water deep yeah <laughs> okay there, there you go you just invented a new a new module to <laughs> yeah to perfect write. for your murder hobos right um yeah no and i i think the other thing is that you see other designers out there uh like for example there's the matt Koval has made some action-oriented monsters for bosses mm -hmm. that um you know fight in a story-driven way there's nothing to say you know you can go and design that sort of scenario yourself or have a completely different kind of monster uh you know whether it's similar to a lair action or it works differently and you kind of you can remix these things on the fly and mm -hmm. um you know depending on how much of a war gamer you want to be versus how fluid you want to be just really thinking about how that applies that tone applies to what you want to evoke i think there's just a lot of flexibility there that lets people to be designers and lets people be creative and i, mm -hmm. I guess that's that's my suggestion for folks mm -hmm. yeah what we've, what we've basically said is that encounters aren't just combat the, the entire experience is is an encounter literally every roll of the dice you could it, it, you know should be approached in the mindset of resource yeah use what's the and, dramatic question exactly. what's the resource at stake what am i losing for this yeah every every single interaction almost wow cool great oh, that's uh there that was really really good really really fun um yeah thank you yeah thanks for having me on yeah um is there anything you would like to plug yeah i guess uh if you want to follow me on twitter um, my handle is at shango games and then also i publish uh free titles on dms guild i have a bunch of magic item supplements out there right now and i'll be having some uh new releases coming out soon i'm going to be re releasing a uh little accompaniment to candlekeep mysteries when that drops so stay tuned for that and i try to post uh free stuff monthly so um you know give me a follow and if you do uh, a review is always greatly appreciated so let me know what you everybody thinks and uh let me know what you want to see next Hmm. Let's take a look at the uh, the reforged magic items that you've got mm -hmm. up on there. Yeah. And uh, yes, I'm going to be taking a deep look at that because that, that sounds like <laughs> yeah. you've got some pre-built side quests in there, which is yeah, yeah. always useful. Yeah, yeah. It's about, uh, you know, if you have your uh, dagger of venom that you want to go upgrade and, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of a an option to go do that. And really, it's that's more to, you know, all these things are tools to get you to think mm -hmm. uh, creatively and to, to, to figure out what works in the similar way for your own campaign and your own players and that one is a great one you can extrapolate out. Mm -hmm. so. I like the, the video gamey aspect of that, of like, you know, taking your sword, taking it somewhere, getting the something made into it. So it's now the next the next version up, as you said in the in the description, Staff of Adder into the Staff of the Naga. Yeah, and there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of, um, you know, it's just, I think thinking about how you can infuse story, whether it's through encounters, whether it's through magic items, you know, just the more personable memorable you can make it ends up with a more deep experience for your players and a more memorable experience so mm -hmm. yeah cool well thank you again for your your input and, and thoughts today on encounters and uh thank you all at home for listening usual shout outs to my socials uh would be appreciated otherwise yep yeah, thank you all for listening and good night